Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship through Decatur First United Methodist Church. My name is Dalton Rushing. I'm one of the pastors here. It's a real pleasure to be in worship with you this morning. If you're with us for the first time, know that you're welcomed by the God who welcomes all of us. It's so good to be together. Uh, and if you're worshiping online or worshiping in person, know uh, just how honored we are to be together. At this time, I'll invite the welcome team to come forward to distribute the attendance pads for our ritual of fellowship. If you are worshiping in person, you'll be invited to take a pad, sign it, pass it down the pew. Once it reaches the end of the pew, pass it back and take a look at who's seated around you so that later in the service, we can greet one another by name. And if you're worshiping online, I'd invite you to fill out an online connect card. You'll see that in the video description or the comments. Let me turn to our announcements. You'll see on the back of your bulletin a fairly complete list of the announcements of this congregation. We've got a number of things upcoming. Uh, Janice will say more about uh, what's been going on at the church and uh, what uh, is coming up this week as she prepares for the prayer. But I'll also note that there's information about the theater summer camp, uh, work day at Avondale Patillo, youth open gym. And I'll note that the church parking lot was supposed to be repaved last week, but the weather kept that from happening. So one of these days, we will repave the parking lot. Just keep an eye out, and I appreciate your flexibility on that. Uh, friends, I think that's plenty for me for now. Would you stand as you're able for our call to worship? The name of the Lord is majestic. The mountains tower and the seas roar in praise of God. When we look at the heavens, we rejoice in God. The moons, stars, planets, and solar systems are a delight to us. Come, let us shout our praise to God. Lord, thank you for this awesome creation. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 158 in the United Methodist Hymnal. It is Come Christians Join to Sing. Let's sing together.
As we prepare for our prayer time this morning, we remember all that is going on in our church family beyond Sunday mornings. Last week was our youth tour on the Georgia coast. I was honored to be a chaperone on the tour, and I can't say enough good things about it. Our youth were kind, compassionate, and so much fun. I was always proud and never embarrassed that they were representing our church, and there is a 50-50 chance that they would say the same about me. <laughs> Next week, we will welcome over 50 children to our campus for Compassion Camp. This ministry is a gift to our kids and to kids we don't even know yet. The volunteers and staff that make it possible are just extraordinary. So as we pray today and going into the coming weeks, we give thanks and we bless the mission and ministry of this family of faith. Let us pray. God of spirit and truth, we often long for more. We want more than the hamster wheel of life consumed with to-do lists, errands, schedules, and alarm clocks. We want more than comparison and competition. We want more than certainty that drowns out curiosity. We want more than fear that leads to violence. The summer is a green and growing season when what has been planted comes to fullness of life. Can it be that way for us as well? We want a life that is overwhelmed with alleluias. We want a life crowded with hope. We want a life congested with good news. We want a life jam-packed with grace and forgiveness. We want a life bursting with laughter. We want a life full of rolled away stones, rushing wind, and holy truth that we are not too preoccup preoccupied to notice. So today we pray, break the dam dust the cobwebs from our ears, clear the space in our minds to hear you clearly. Speak to us as only you can. It's what we long for. We long for you. And we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
please stand as you are able for a reading from the Gospel of our Lord. This is the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He won't speak on his own, but will say whatever he hears, and will proclaim to you what is to come. He will glorify me, because he will take what is mine and proclaim it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That's why I said that the Spirit takes what is mine and will proclaim it to you. Soon, you won't be able to see me. Soon after that, you will see me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. As we prepare for the sermon, I invite you to pray with and for me. Let us pray. O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. My father is an internist. And before my mom retired, she taught nursing students. And one of the core values of every medical family I have ever encountered is this. You call body parts by their actual medical names. You call all body parts by their actual medical names. There is no room for euphemism in a medical family. Things are what they are and they aren't what they aren't. Body parts, symptoms, bodily functions, all of it. It made for some embarrassing conversations with my parents as I was growing up. Although, once I had children of my own, I came to appreciate that I could do the same thing to them. Growing up in my family, you called body parts by their actual names. You had to prove that you were sick with a thermometer or evidence of chicken pox. You relied upon data and science and proof. And let me say that this background has helped me absolutely none when it comes to studying theology. <laughs> now I will tell you, I do hold truth in very high regard. When I find out that somebody's lying to me, it just wrecks me. I also hope that growing up in a home where data mattered a lot helps me see both sides of arguments. Not that it keeps me from advocating for the things I believe in, but I have a heart for making sure that I understand a steel man argument. Have you ever heard of a steel man argument? Not a straw man argument, which is the opposite. A steel man argument is the idea that before you argue against something, you should understand the best version of that other person's argument before you decide how to respond. You see, truth I'm, I'm good with. What I struggle with, what I felt completely unprepared for when I went to seminary is mystery. I struggle with not knowing. I like facts and data and clarity. I do less well with feelings and ambiguity and mystery. There is a part of me, a small part of me maybe, but a part of me that wishes that I could understand my way to God. As if I learned enough, then I would find myself in God's presence. Of course, that's not how this works. Learning's good. Knowing's good. Facts are good. But head knowledge is not the key to salvation. Now the church has struggled with this for generations. 
It's one of the oldest problems of the church, actually, the idea that if you just had some secret knowledge that you would be okay. We call it a heresy in the church, which is one of the strongest words we use, something that is so opposed to our faith in God as it is laid out in Scripture that the church has said no. Knowledge is good, but you cannot learn your way to Jesus. You cannot understand your way to the heart of God. In fact, one of my favorite images comes from one of the early church fathers known as the Pseudo-Dionysus who wrote a work called Mystical Theology. This is really heady stuff, I know, but maybe you'll find it interesting. Back in the 6th century, this early theologian talked about the problems with language. That when we describe God using human terms, we by definition limit who God is because human language is finite, but God is infinite. So when we talk about God, we say things like God is good, which is true, but also God's goodness is far beyond our understanding of that word. We talk about God as father or mother, as a loving parent. Those are images that come straight out of the Bible and they're true, but the way in which God is a loving parent is so much larger than our understanding of those words. So the pseudo-Dionysus says, this writer says, maybe one way to deal with this problem is to take words away, sort of pluck them out of the air. He calls this negative theology or apophatic theology. And what it means is that just as we are faithful in describing God with words, we are also faithful in removing those words one at a time until there is nothing left to do but sit in stunned silence in the presence of God. Now, I don't think we should always sit in silence. You pay me to talk about God. (laughs) It's just that the mystery of God requires us sometimes to sit in that mystery to sort of revel in it, to experience the God who is bigger than we could possibly imagine. And if you need proof of concept, you need look no further than to the idea, the doctrine, the teaching of the Trinity, which is our primary way of understanding God as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. All the parts of God are related, but none of them are the same, even as we believe that they are of one substance. And if that doesn't make any sense to you, if it blows your mind a little bit, well then good, because the Trinity, the nature of God, is at its core a great mystery. Now let me step to the side a little bit and acknowledge that this is a big deal. That this kind of mystery is particularly hard for a certain kind of person to swallow, namely, one whose parents used the correct anatomical names for everything. I'm somebody who likes to know. I'm a little bit of a news junkie. Stacy calls me, my wife calls me her celebrity death reporter, and every couple there's one who breaks the news to the other. There's a part of me that believes that if I can just learn a little bit more, if I can just understand a little bit more, If I could just read a little bit more, then somehow I'll be able to make the right choices, to get ahead in life, to wrap my mind around everything. And the truth is that while facts are good, they are important. Truth matters. It's likewise the case that while truth and facts are related, those two words are not synonyms. Truth and facts are not synonyms. They are not identical. We should be people who rely on facts, who seek to be factual all the time. But while it is the case that truth is buttressed, it is held up by facts, truth is bigger than facts. Truth, at times, involves a good deal of mystery. And we forget about this dynamic at our own peril. Because when we understand something, we gain some level of control over it. And if it is the case that we cannot control God, then claiming to understand God means that what we understand is not actually God at all. Because we can't control God. Rather, what we understand is some idol, some copy of a copy of a copy with 
marks in the margins and fuzziness in the text. And that's not worth worshiping. You know what I mean? I know this is all really heady stuff. But truthfully, it's the center of our faith. Naming things matters. Calling the nature of God as love is good. Calling God Father is good. Calling God the Trinity is good. But there's so much more behind those names that forgetting the mystery of God keeps us from experiencing the majesty of God. And if we're not careful, we miss out on that majesty. I don't want to miss out on that, do you? I had an interesting experience this last week. I probably had 10 people, a number of folks in this room, in fact, come up to me and ask a strange question. They asked me whether I had watched the University of Louisville baseball team play in the College Baseball World Series. Now, I like baseball. I do not make it a habit to watch college-level baseball in Kentucky. So I thought it was a strange question until I realized what they were actually asking. It turns out that the University of Louisville Cardinals, who are pretty good this year, have a catcher who is pretty good this year. And it turns out that his name is Dalton Rushing. I want you to know that despite my stellar physique, I have not been moonlighting as a catcher for the University of Louisville. ESPN, and you heard that Dalton Rushing was up to bat, you would be forgiven for a skeptical reaction. Friends, names are good. The theologian Frederick Buechner says that every person's favorite sound is the sound of their own name. And I think this is right. But there is so much more going on with me than can be conjured up with my name. Never mind the labels that we put on people. Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, black, white, straight, gay, male, female, educated, uneducated, I could go on. There is so much more because we each of us was created in the image of a God whose very being, whose very nature is shrouded in mystery. You are so much more than your name because our beings are also shrouded in that same mystery because we were made in the image of that mysterious God. Jesus knew this, of course, better than anybody. Not only was he related to God, he was God. That's the nature of the Trinity. He is God. In this morning's scripture passage in the Gospel of John, Jesus is quoted as saying this, I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. However, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. He won't speak on his own, but will say whatever he hears and will proclaim to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and proclaim it to you. Everything that the Father has is mine. That's why I said that the Spirit takes what is mine and will proclaim it to you. Now friends, notice what Jesus does not say. He does not say when the Holy Spirit arrives that you will understand everything. What he says is that when the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit will guide you in truth. He goes on to say, I have much more to say to you, but you can't handle it now. You are finite. You are not capable of understanding the infinite. And so all of our human language breaks down at the end of the day. It's good to talk about God. I do it for a living, but talking about God is insufficient. Every word, every metaphor is insufficient. Even the website where the United Methodist Church posts scripture commentary and preaching helps has this to say about the gospel lesson for today, Trinity Sunday. This is a quote from the United Methodist Church. The first Sunday after Pentecost today is known as Trinity Sunday. One explanation reports that this is the Sunday where you explain the Trinity. Good luck with that. <laughs> well, with denominational friends like these, 
And yet it's true. Every metaphor fails because the Trinity is a mystery. I've heard all kinds of metaphors for how the Trinity is supposed to work. God's like a three-leaf clover. God's like the three states of water, gas, liquid, and solid. God's like the sun, which is a star and light and heat. Or God is like a person who is a spouse and a parent and an employer. And none of these metaphors work at the end of the day because they all seek To explain a mystery, and the nature of mystery is that it cannot be explained. Neither can it be controlled. So I will tell you how I think of the Trinity. I like the metaphor of a mountain. Not just any mountain, but this mountain in particular. This mountain is in Meteora in Greece. I visited it 20 years ago. We were on a tour and we were planning to drive up a nearby mountain where an ancient monastery was located at the top. The kind of monastery where the only way in those days to get a monk up or down was with a pulley and a basket. On that day, the ice on the roads and on the landscape was so thick that I am not kidding when I tell you the back end of that bus was hanging off the mountain and I was on the back end of that bus. So we got off and we climbed for a long time in thick ice and we got to the top and we looked out and we saw this. You look at something like this and you cannot help but recognize the nature of your place in the world as compared to God. I find the metaphor of this mountain to be compelling. Not because it explains the nature of the Trinity. You can talk about it, but you can't explain it. But when I think of my experience of climbing that mountain and seeing this view, I am reminded of what it feels like to be in the presence of God. God, it is beautiful for its own sake, not preachy, quiet, but it calls us to wonder. Maybe you've heard of the concept of a thin place, a place where it feels as if the veil between heaven and earth is especially thin. In my memory, this scene is a thin place for me. I don't know what thin place you go to in your mind. But it might be a metaphor for you as you think about the nature of God. And so I do hope you'll spend your life and your faith exploring that nature. The mystery of God whose nature is Trinity. It is a worthy use of time. And at the end of the day, all exploring of God is at its heart worship. But rather than seeking to completely understand, I would encourage you to seek to know. I don't mean that you should know like you know things from an encyclopedia. I mean, do you know your neighbor or your pastor or the grocery store clerk? Do you know one another? Do you know your spouse? Do you really know yourself? Not so much do you know everything about God, but do you know God? For at its heart, the Trinity is a mystery. The Trinity cannot be fully understood. But you can, and you should, spend your whole life getting to know it. Thanks be to God.
You may be seated. At this time, I invite our welcome team forward to receive God's tithes and our offerings. If you would like to give to support the ongoing and faithful ministries of Decatur First United Methodist Church, there are multiple ways to give. Of course, if you are in person, you may give in person. If you're worshiping online or if you prefer to give that way, you may go to our website at decaturfirst.org give, or you can text the word Decatur to 73256. Will you join me in our offering prayer? Almighty God, giver of every good and perfect gift, teach us to give to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may praise you, not with our words only, but with our whole lives. Amen. remain standing and join me in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our final hymn is number 368, My Hope is Built. Friends, you may be seated. Just before the end of the service, I'm really excited that we're going to be commissioning our first class of care ministers. These folks have spent hours and hours and weeks and weeks learning more about how to best care for this congregation and its community. It is a fine group of people, and we're really grateful for them. I cannot overemphasize how, how much training these folks have been through over the course of the last number of weeks I'm just very grateful. I'm also grateful for Blair Setner and for Woody Spackman for helping to lead this particular group. We're going to commission these folks, and I want you to see them as an extension of the pastoral and staff ministry here at the church. If there is anything you need, these are your folks. These are your people, and so we're grateful for them. No pressure or anything. We're going to commission these folks, and we've got a liturgy that we'll use uh, now, and it involves the clergy. So I'm going to invite Blair and and Woody, if you'd read along uh, with me, if you've got that too. We pray for those to be commissioned into our care ministry. There are many gifts of the Spirit, and we have each been given our own unique gifts to share with others in the name and in the service of God. I invite you all to read, May God be with you in your ministry to which you are to be commissioned. And may God help us to discern our own calling 
and ministry. We ask you who are to be commissioned these questions. Do you believe that you are called by God to this ministry? Will you be faithful to God in offering of yourself for this ministry? I say to you, the congregation, people of God, will you pray for and support those to be commissioned? With the help of God, we will. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you call us to care for all your people. Deepen our faith and make us more aware of the world in which you call us to serve. By your Holy Spirit, may all whom you call Share your gospel of love and peace, relying not on ourselves alone, but on Jesus, who is our friend and companion, now and forever. Amen. We have certificates for each of you to mark this auspicious day. Uh, Would you join me in uh, thanking the New Care Ministers for their good work? And now, dear friends, oh, you know what? Some days I'll feel like you just got to jump on a pew, so let me do that. I, I, the, the Trinity is a mystery. God is a mystery. The life of faith is a mystery. It is one that we will never understand, but it is one that God calls us to continually dive deeper into. And so, dear friends, my invitation to you is to go out into the world, to love extravagantly, give generously, serve faithfully, live simply, speak truthfully, pray daily, and leave everything else to God. For God is with us now, and God will be with us forever. Thanks be to God. Amen. Go in peace.